semen. You need to be crowned. Goodness me. Look at that. Oh, that is big enough for my enormous head. How very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. How very sweet they are. What wonderful um, and successful campaign they have to make themselves filmmakers, harnessing the power of what one might as well call the Twinternet at this stage. That's to say, the Twitter-powered internet, which is something I'd like to talk about. I'm here to have a word, I suppose, on behalf of that um, that awful object, um, the celebrity Twitter, uh, something that is really without wishing to boast on behalf of celebrities, which would be an almost impossible thing to do because I know how much contempt the world rightly has for us as a breed, but it has driven Twitter. Um, a year ago, um, really you would have to throw a lot of stones in Times Square before they hit the head of anybody who had heard of Twitter. It was not well known. The press didn't know about it. Very few people did. It hadn't been around for very long. Things move so fast in the online world, that, and, and, and one of the things that moves very fast is our memory. We forget very quickly how recent things are. And, um, and the bewilderment, contempt, disbelief with which Twitter was greeted is one of the great stories of its, of its development. Um, there is perhaps nothing more amusing than watching all those people who said Twitter just the most but now, pointless waste of time I have ever heard of. And they said it so loud that they're deeply embarrassed now to be going, yeah, well, our Twitter strategy is such that dot, dot, dot. Well, I'm not here to blame them because I remember that happening with email back in the late 80s, when again, you really had to look very far to find anybody who'd heard of it. The only people I knew who, like me, were on email were fellow dweeb, dork, nerd, geeks um, in Spokane, Washington or, or Sydney, Australia, with whom one would have email conversations purely on the subject of tweaking one's subnet mask or some other such pointless thing or how to write an interslip script or a PPP script in order to uh, enrich one's uh, online experience at the very low data rates that one enjoyed in those days. And I remember trying to say to people that electronic mail seemed like a good idea, and, and, they, were, and they said, as people always do when something new comes along, what's the point? Why, why would I need that? And it's a very odd thing how people think they're being smart when they abandon their humanity when they speak not as human beings, but as business people. As if somehow that is the vindication for who they are. So in my business, for example, I need a phone that does this, or I need something that does that. I need a social network that delivers this, that promises that, that has this model. They're suddenly not speaking like human beings anymore. I'm in a fortunate position of knowing a lot of real industry leaders, people at the very, very top of their field, who run enormous companies or have founded whole industries. And not one of them talks like that. They don't go on about business models. They don't talk about what they need. They talk about what excites them. They talk about what thrills them. Because they remember they are human beings. And therefore, they're consumers, if you want to call them consumers. They're customers, if you want to call them customers are human beings. And human beings, before they are intellectual, before they are reasoning, are emotional creatures. We are all emotional. It's the reason for the success, let's be obvious, of Jonathan Ive at Apple, is he understands that if you have a device in your pocket which communicates with everyone and everything, and which you use to access knowledge and to access people and to access information, this is an emotional relationship you have, an emotional relationship. It's really very simple. It, therefore, you want something in your pocket that makes you smile, that you stroke. Occasionally will annoy you, of course, like a, a real thing. Not something that just plain delivers function, because that's not who we are. We are human beings. And therefore, it perhaps retrospectively should come as no surprise that the next big thing of the internet a year ago 
was something that connected us as human beings in the most basic, primitive, and simple way. It wasn't devised by business for business. It wasn't devised as a means of generating money and revenue. It was simply, as its name said, a way of getting people to babble inconsequentially to each other in an enjoyable way. You must remember, it's called Twitter. There are no plans by Biz Stone or anybody else to rename it serious debate or marketing tool. It is Twitter. And if you forget that's what it is, then you forget the purpose of it and you forget the millions who belong to it, for whom it is and always should be Twitter. And there is something about a social network, a web of social interaction, like a spider's web, which means those who are part of it are immensely sensitive to every twitch on the filament of, of its gossamer. And they know straight away when someone is selling them, when someone is preaching to them, when someone is trying to manipulate them. And that is not what Twitter is about. So however many of you here to talk about your Twitter strategy and marketing and your, 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 your Twitter tactics when it comes to selling, I, I'm all for it. It's absolutely wonderful. It's an open world and I'm not an anti-market person and I, I don't have any, any problem with business. It put us all where we are. I'm very happy for it. But I just think it is incumbent on all of us and all of you who are interested in that to understand the nature of this institution, this phenomenon, Twitter. It is a human shaped, not business shaped. And it is up to business to accommodate itself to that, to that frenzied babbling of Twitter, not up to Twitter to accommodate itself to what business would prefer. And that's an important thing to remember, because otherwise the shift will go away. The pulse, the swell will move elsewhere. If you try and make it all square and neat and attractive, then the great buzz and the great organic energy of Twitter will be removed. Um, I suppose, uh, and I've written about this, that there is a, a kind of analogy or a comparison that could be made in terms of what Twitter is now offering and doing uh, uh, to the arrival of the printing presses in popular form, as you probably know, in about 1450, Gutenberg developed movable type, which revolutionized the world. Between 1450, when there were no printed books in the world, not one, not a single one, and 1500, 50 years later, there were 20 million. That was a hell of a revolution, an unbelievable revolution. And, and it opened the way to everything that we are now. But even then, this was a, an art that was not easily mastered. It was really by the beginning of the 18th century, the 1720s and 30s, that presses became available for larger numbers of people. And because of our Bill of Rights in this country in 1688, 1689, depending on which calendar you go by, um, there was a, a new freedom of the press. And this, uh, this caused huge, huge upheavals in our social culture and indeed in the development of our prosperity. Because what happened was uh, huge numbers of magazines and broadsheets and pamphlets arose which, which changed the way everybody thought. And do you want to know a very peculiar thing? The most successful of them were not called debate or arena or forum, they were called and they still exist today in very different forms. They were called the idler, the rambler, the tattler, the spectator. These were not heavily disposed. These were gentle ways of connecting people together. But they turned out to be the biggest political force that our culture had ever seen. And as a political force, of course, also a business force. Because in that same period, Britain went from being a rather ordinary and unfortunate kingdom that had suffered a civil war and upheavals and riots to the most powerful imperial nation on earth. By the end of the 18th century and the Battle of Plessy, we, we had a Raj and we had an empire. And, um, and it's, not in, it's not irrelevant that it was also the time of, of our free press and of the energy of it. The irony now is, of course, the, our journalists and their view of Twitter. There was no class of person more contemptuous of Twitter 
than the commentating journalist in Britain a, a, a year ago, eight months ago, six months ago. Twitter, aren't you just fed up with Twitter, they would go. Why should we care about what Britney Spears ate for breakfast or what Stephen Fry thinks about this? Uh, and uh, quite, why should they? I absolutely agree. Then don't, don't fucking write about it, you idiot. You should be claiming you don't care. Then don't, don't write about it. I mean, did anything ever more reveal how much they did care than how much every day they wrote about how dreadful Twitter was, followed the next week by, follow our new Twitter stream, the Daily Mail's on Twitter. Follow at Twitter, DailyMailTwitter.com. They got slightly wrong, obviously, the whole thing. Um, and, but I can understand it, because a number of things in Twitter really do disturb what, if I can be unkind enough to call, the Deadwood Press is worried about. Firstly, of course, uh, and least importantly, but most publicly, is the celebrity business. Um, people like me, twillionaires, if you will, um, <laughs> we can cut out the press from our PR requirements. We don't need them anymore. It used to be that there was a kind of pact made with the devil if you were someone who had produced a television program or a film or a book. And that is you would consent to be interviewed by a journalist in order to push your book or your film or your TV series. And the price of that was obviously no journalist of any repute was going to interview you if they were just being an unpaid PR marketer for you. So they would have the right to ask you other questions around the book, which always annoyed the author or the actor or the film director because they were getting asked irritating questions that they didn't want to answer. And unless they were a huge star who could lay down the law, I will only answer on this film. I will answer no other questions. I won't talk about my divorce, my predilection for Colombian powders and other <laughs> such questions that might be asked. Um, well now, and if you've got more than a million or so and your PR person comes and says, this, this magazine, this paper wants to interview you, you say, well, no, how many, what's their, what's their circulation? And they go, oh, it's, it's a million and a half. And if you're Britney Spears, you go, <laughs> why should I care about that? I can speak to millions just by typing into my keyboard. And not only that, you can say, let's say there's a showbiz journalist called uh, uh, Peter Servetish. Um, Peter Servetish writes something unpleasant about you in the newspaper, and you can instantly tell Twitter, oh, Peter Stoglish is a tosser. Everyone in show business hates him. Everyone knows he, he is useless. Whenever he goes to showbiz parties, people just laugh at him because he's completely unconnected. Well, you can imagine how Peter Stoglish is going to take to that. He knows his editor's going to read that. His editor is reading that millions of people who are their core customer base for gossip and tattle and celebrity news are laughing at their celebrity journalist and saying that he's a nobody and he's an outsider. This is really aggravating if you're a journalist, really upsetting and worrying. On the other hand, how useful a Twitter stream is for lazy news reporting. So you can just simply report whatever the celebrity is saying and dress it up a bit and follow it. You don't have to check anything. So the whole thing's in a really weird state at the moment. The newspapers, on the one hand, are filled with resentment at Twitter. On the other hand, they rely on it because it's a source of free, it's a feed. So, I mean, in fact, they actually call it a feed rather than a stream. You may have noticed that. I, I see that Stephen Fry said on his Twitter feed yesterday, which is very revealing when, when that's printed because it shows that they think of it as like a Reuters or, or you know, other press association feed that's coming out for their, for their information, and they just report it. So if one was very bloody-minded, one could, of course, tell all kinds of lies about oneself just in order to watch the newspapers repeat them, because they are, of course, very lazy in that respect. So that's one side of how Twitter is, as I say, puzzling, perplexing, aggravating, irking the, the Deadwood press. Another, and perhaps more significant one, was revealed in a series of what you might call tipping points. There have been many in, in Twitter over the past year. But there were some in this country, at least, a, a month back, um, uh, firstly, um, there was the case of a, 
uh, of a legal firm slapping an injunction on the Guardian newspaper, allowing them not, or rather <laughs> forbidding them, to talk about the Trafigura toxic waste dumping scandal. Um, and uh, not only were the Guardian not allowed to talk about this, they were not allowed to report a question that had gone on in Parliament. They were not allowed to mention the name of the MP who tabled the question. It was an extraordinary assault on, on, on freedom of speech, unthinkable in any European country and completely unthinkable in America. The First Amendment would have protected that kind of thing. And many people thought it was absolutely scandalous. And rightly so. And online, there were all the resources you needed to circumvent this absurd injunction, what Francis Wien of Private Eye called this super injunction, an injunction on an injunction on an injunction, if you like. Um, I joined in quite late one morning. I'd come from the gym. <laughs> it's pathetic. I can't believe I said that, but it's true. I'd come from the gym, and I was looking through the sort of, and I kept seeing these references to Trafigura, which was already trending, I may say. Um, and so I looked at the story and I pointed people to various websites that had been pointed to me uh, about this and said, oh, you can go to this website and learn all, all the facts, um, all of which no journalist would have been able to print, but which were available. Anyway, the thing reached such a, a heat that by, the, by, by one or two in the afternoon, um, MPs were um, tweeting about it and, and the lawyers basically had to had to get rid of their injunction because it'd been made a complete nonsense of. Um, and, and this was considered a triumph, if you like, for, for Twitter and for, for free speech and, for, and, and for, the, for the way people got together. Of course, because in this country, at least, I am associated so much with Twitter, and because I had tweeted about this, the newspapers the next day quoted my Twitter feed as if I had been the one behind it which rightly annoyed those who knew more because they thought I was somehow taking the credit for this and in fact anybody who knows Twitter knows you can investigate any tweet and see the dates and see quite clearly when you examine a trend where it began and, and how it started and the whole point about Twitter is it is, it is a mass movement, it is a, a wisdom and very often a folly of crowds that determines how Twitter works and not individuals like me. So I was very upset, partly because I, I thought, well, I look as if I'm taking credit for this and I'm not. So I, I was sort of embarrassed, if you like. And then the next day, you, you, even worse, if you like, a, a journalist from the Daily Mail wrote a, a really vindictive and unpleasant piece about a recently dead uh, a pop star called Stephen Gately, who happened, although I haven't made a great fuss about this, to be a friend of mine and particularly a friend of my partner, who was on his way to Dublin to his funeral when this article came out and, and was with the family and uh, saw the devastating effect of this malevolently phrased article, which there may have been a point that this woman was trying to make. If so, she did it, she did it very, very badly, and I'm sure she'd be the first to admit now she did it very badly. Again, her name was trending when someone told me about this article. I didn't create the story of the story, if you like, I merely also pointed people to the Press Complaints Commission if they wanted to make a complaint, and pointed people to some, a brilliant article by Charlie Brooker, um, which dismantled this, this poisonous piece of so-called journalism. And, and, and so it was that this itself became a story. It was the record number of complaints ever made to the Press Commission. And naturally, the mass ranks, uh, ranks of the right-wing press then sort of had a bit of a a backlash and saying, who the fuck does Stephen Fry think he is attacking this perfectly free journalist who's allowed to, uh, uh, allowed to express her opinion? And as if I'd said she wasn't allowed to express her opinion. And, and, and you know, it became a, a sort of fight and, it, and, and it, a very distressing one to me because, again, I hadn't created this story. I'd merely participated in it, but because of the weight of my numbers of followers and because of the laziness of journalism, I was the one who was somehow credited or blamed, either way it was wrong, for creating the story. And it's really important for me that people understand that the, the Twitter millions are the ones who decide these stories. Yes. Obviously, someone who has a lot of followers can be an influence, can, can point people in the direction. But as I said in my blog afterwards, if I, if I told people to vote for Nick Griffith of the, the, the BNP, they wouldn't just because I'd said so. It's like the old 
parent thing when you moan that a friend had told you to do it or something. So, well, if you told him to stick your head in a fire, would you do that? <laughs> you know? I, I mean, it, it is such a pity that so many people who don't understand Twitter, and there's no, there's no intellectual complexity that makes you understand it. It is merely participating in it that allows you to understand it. If you participate in Twitter, by which I mean if you tweet and read other people's tweets, and are aware of the, the pulse and the rhythm of, 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 a, of an average tweet day, if you like, a twittering day, then you understand it. And then you know where the, 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 the noise really comes from. Like all parts of the internet, there are unpleasant elements, there are, there are people who are going to be there to insult, but you can block them. There are people who are, um, who are perhaps sycophantic to a degree that is embarrassing, um, and you have to shut your ears to that. But it, it, it seems a terrible pity that people cheat by basically describing Twitter in ways that don't fit it, but basically making an enemy of it, shaping it in the, in, in the shape of their enemy, and therefore dissing it. It is much more protean than that. It is much more organic than that. It is the sum of the people. In that sense, it's like a city. I always said about the internet when it began, and people moaned about this aspect or that aspect of it. And, and, and there was a period, you may remember, when, when a lot of people were on commercial areas, sort of roofed off areas, as it were, of the, of the internet, like uh, America Online. And, and, uh, and, and I said then, the internet is like a city. And, 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 and the great cities of the world have, have built up organically in different ways. And like great cities, it has its museums, its art galleries, it has its libraries, its resources, it has its teeming millions, and it has its slums, and it has its red light districts, it has areas you wouldn't want children to go alone and unaccompanied, and it has churches, and it has businesses, and it has shops, and it has all those qualities. And, and, and cities have a small amount of governance, but essentially the nature and atmosphere of a city is determined by its citizens. And that's who make it what it is. And you don't allow IBM or Apple or Microsoft or whoever it is to come in and redesign the city. You don't say uh, that the, um, the network providers of, of, of water and gas are going to knock all the buildings down and tell us how we're going to live and pull all our houses in straight lines. We essentially, there's a kind of bubbling mixture of anarchy and liberty and a sort of social organization, a, communi a communitarian self-help, plus, yes, governance that makes it all muddle together in an inefficient way. Sometimes the traffic is unbearable in a city. Sometimes the, the pollution and the noise and the aggression and the crime make you think, I'm not going to live in this city anymore. But generally speaking, thank God for these places. What energy they give us. What excitement. What commerce. What brilliance. What innovation. And, the, and Twitter is part of that energy. It's part of that dynamic in human history. And of course it will be replaced or it will fuse into something else. Of course it will. Uh, there is a new next big thing brewing in someone's mind. They probably don't know it will be the next big thing any more than Biz Stone knew that Twitter would be the next big thing. But something will happen and it will excite us. But all I would urge you to do is to remember how I open with. Remember these things are human shaped. Not business shaped or corporate shaped or government shaped, but human shaped. And don't deny yourself or the internet the pleasure of your own humanity and laughter and joy and friendship. Thank you all very much.